Hello, and welcome to the very first event of the Humor Arts Museum. I am Reverend Barbara Ann Michaels, Jester of the Peace. I'm a clown theater artist and an interfaith minister, and I found institutions and organizations for humor and wellness. And Humor Arts Museum is for humorous, uplifting art in all media. And we have begun online and in time, Next year in 2023, there will be physical shows and eventually Humor Arts Museum will have a home. So what is Humor Arts Museum? The whole spectrum of, is important. The whole spectrum of expressing humor, sarcastic humor, edgy humor, angry humor. We've seen a lot of that and also uplifting, heart-centered, joyful humor. And what I've discovered is that there's a lot more outlets in terms of the news, like it bleeds, it leads. Um, angry art gets more attention and it's absolutely vital to make it. We must have sarcastic, edgy art. And since it has so many more, uh, it just ha it has so many more outlets. I realized that there wasn't an outlet for uplifting humorous art to reliably go and look at this work and feel better and feel uplifted. So my the three pillars that I operate under are art and love and humor. And those are my personal daily practices. They're how I navigate the mystery of life. And my purpose here is to institutionalize, by creating an institution, my purpose is to institutionalize art, love and humor as, as daily practices, as, as societal practices. To the degree that art has gotten stuck in museums and humor has gotten stuck in the comedy industry, we may hear people say things like, oh, I'm not funny, I'm not a comedian. Or, oh, I'm not creative, I can't draw. As if that's the sum total of how creativity and how humor can act in our lives when truly humor, art, and love are the great re-regulators of the human spirit. They're part of the human condition. We are designed to turn communally to art, to love and to humor in order to balance our minds, to balance our hearts, to reconnect with each other. If part of the purpose of turning to a practice is to reconnect, art, love and humor are the fastest that I know. And so I created two organizations. One of them is a non-religious congregation called House of Holy Humor the pillars of which are art, love, and humor. And underneath the banner of House of Holy Humor is Humor Arts Museum, a place to celebrate visual art in all media that's specifically about that up uplifting place. So we can go there and rest, exhale, feel resonant, relax, smile, laugh, and feel good. It's a place to feel good because that particular brand of the art world doesn't get as much attention as the edge. And there's a, so there's a need, particularly because we have a global mental health crisis going on right now. And uh, we have a global mental health crisis going on right now and people need to exhale. People need to find laughter and remember that we can turn to humor and to art to, to, to basically return to ourselves and each other so we can live well. So that is, uh, that is why Humor Arts Museum exists. And that is why House of Holy Humor exists. So, and this is our very first day. It's the very first day, the very first event. I am so honored that you are here because for all of my days creating these, I'm going to, hold on, let me find, the, let me find my mute button. Um, I'm looking for it. <laughs> if anyone else sees their mute button. Um, participants, uh, how come I can't find my mute button? That's pretty funny, right? So at the Humor Arts Museum, when things go wrong, we just smile and laugh because that's, you know, that's what there is to do. Uh, oh, here we go. I found my mute button. Uh, Evan, well. Okay. Yeah, hi. So, uh, so going back, I, so this is our very first day. It's the very first event. And what I was saying is I'm so honored that you're here because for all of my days, having put my, my, my heart's intentions for the world for generations into these projects, I know that you were here on the first day. And it means so much to me that you are the ones who are here and I will always have that and appreciate you for that. So thank you so very much. Um, and now we are going to turn over to talk about this first show. So I met, Karen Gersh, because I was walking down the street 
in Beacon and I walked by this art center and they had humorous art outside on the street. And I said, what in the world kind of a place is going to show this humorous art in the street? And I wanna show you what I saw. This is what I saw, oh, wait, that's not it, hold on. Oh, yes, that it is. So I walk, I'm walking down the street in Beacon and I'm saying, who in the world is curating an egg with feet? And who in the world is curating a twisty curvy column? I must meet this person. I just, I need to know who they are. And so I walked into this place and lo and behold, Karen E. Gersh had curated it. And we met each other and then realized that both of us are clowns. We have at least 5,000 mutual friends and colleagues. We've worked for some of the same organizations. We have a deep resonance for humor and transformation and humor and wellness, which is what this is really all about. We became fast friends and now we have Humor Arts Museum is really excited to welcome Karen as our first curator. And so we started off with a solo show for Karen, which I will just, um, which I will briefly share. And then we will turn to her and Jean being interviewed. So this, and this is some of her work that's on the website right now. So as I said before, Humor Arts Museum is starting off online. Next year we'll be doing physical shows. And after that one day, one day there will be a home. But this is some of the work that is on the site right now. So we decided let's have a solo show for you, Karen. Let's celebrate who you are as an artist and a curator as you curate what will be our first official uh, first official show that opens on November 14th. Mm. Uh, so uh, Karen is a, uh, she is a lifelong internationally touring acrobat and clown. She is one of the founders of Big Apple Circus and Circus Mercus and more that she will share with you. Mm -hmm. She is a lifelong visual artist and painter. She is a trainer and educator uh, and a curator. And to, and first of all, before we turn to Jean and have the conversation, Karen, I wanna welcome you. Thank you for being our first curator and tell you how honored I am to work with you. Well, it's equally <laughs> a, a huge honor for me. And it's just kismet, you know, both the meeting and, and the way we have begun to work together because I feel like it's a very um, meaningful association and very natural. Yes, yes. You know, yeah. when two clowns get together to do something good, it's gonna be good. Uh, so now I am also going to introduce Gene Seidman. So Gene Seidman is, um, he is, a, hold on. He, so Gene is going to have a conversation with Karen about her artwork because he is a native New Yorker, a lover, a researcher, and a passionate seller of fine art. And he used to run the graphic design department at MoMA. He was a three-term elected official in Westport, Connecticut. He was recently made an ambassador to the organization New Yorkers for Culture and Art. And he's a live auctioneer. And he's my partner. So thank you, Jean, for supporting the Humor <laughs> Arts Museum. And I'm going to turn over the conversation to Jean to have a conversation about how did you come to be here? Why this? Why now? What's the journey? So Jean and Karen, I give you to each other. Okay. Barbara, you, you, Barbara, no fair. You didn't tell me I was talking to an ambassador. That's a whole kettle of fish. Okay. Well, well, well you're an ambassador of joy, so it all He calls out. me an ambassador. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, hello, I'm Jean Seid, and I'm broadcasting from New York City. And uh, Karen, where are you? Um, I'm in Montgomery, New York, the nice little okay. historical village of Montgomery. Okay. Where which, is that near? <laughs> that, that sits somewhere between Newburgh and Middletown um, okay. um, in Orange County, New York. Okay, cool. Well, uh, kudos uh, to Barbara for putting this all together and really coming up with this whole idea of the Humor Arts Museum. Um, I was with Barbara uh, in Beacon that day when we saw the egg with the feet and I kind of looked at it and walked past it and Barbara looked at it and walked in. Uh, <laughs> and then I, I was, I probably, I went for coffee and she said, no, you got to come and see this place. And I walked in and it was, uh, you know, Karen was there 
curating a show there, which was pretty, really pretty remarkable. So let's get right to it. So um, Karen, what was the earliest memory you have of being creative? Oh, of being creative, I ha I can remember. Uh, you, it could be in utero or post. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll skip that, I think. Uh, um, I think when I was around four, um, I can remember very vividly sitting at the table um, in our kitchen in Long Island and I was drawing. And what I was drawing was a witch flying through the air on a broomstick, except this witch had a clown nose. And I still have this drawing. I kept, I kept it because to me, and being at that age, it was, I really, it came out of me and I just said, yes. And I knew nothing about clowns at that point. I had no idea what the red nose was that I had put on this witch, but that was my earliest memory um, that I was constantly drawing. Just, just mm. that was particular drawing was what really resonated with me. Um, so I, you, I drew okay. from. I was always drawing. I drew from life. I didn't know to to do anything but. So, I drew everything I saw. Um, Cray paws, crayons, that. number yeah. two pencils. Yeah. yeah, yeah, simple things that that were at my resources at my fingertips then. That's um, great. Um, so about being a clown, like, um, how did you first know about what a clown was? Okay, so my introduction to circus and clowning, but circus was- I love when you say my introduction to circus, because in my English, I would say my introduction to the circus. And I asked Barbara and she said, no, circus people say they don't use a the, so cool. I, I, you know, but you'll explain why, but keep going. <laughs> it's because it's an entity and it's circus. But my, my introduction was, again, as a, as a very young child, there was a TV program and let's see how many hands go up on this memory. Um, Don Amici's International Circus Hour. Oh, yes. Yes. Sunday night, oh, right around it. the time of. Uh, oh, going to tell us when right it was around the time of Ed Sullivan and. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, I love sure. you. Oh, that's yeah. great. <laughs> Don Amici, man, he was hip. Yeah. I love that yeah. guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and um, he was. It was every week he visited a different international. Hey, if there's circuit. music, hold on. If there's music playing near you, can you just mute yourself? Yeah. Is that you, Karen? You can't mute yourself. Yeah, that was mine, and I should have turned it off. Um, right. uh, sorry. Um, every week he visited a different international circus. So my introduction was to European circus, and that is truly what I fell in love with, was your, and have always remained in love with, was European concept of, of the both circus in terms of the acts, of the ambiance, and of the clowns, which were very specific and very different from American clowning. So okay, when so I you, okay, so you you saw Don Amici, and then uh, and then you joined the circus. Can I say the? You joined. Circus. It wasn't. It wasn't really Don, Don Amici. Wasn't really the guy who was. He was just like the host commentator. He was like the. No, I get it. I yeah, but all yeah. the all the all the performances were, were of different acrobats and amazing clowns and all sorts of wacky circuses. stuff. It was he went to a different circus and film and the show was filmed and he spoke of it. Um, yeah. But that was my that was the first time I was seeing, and that was my education in in and what really made me fall in love with European circus style. So you saw um, circus and then you joined the circus and well that wasn't until saw... much much later. That wasn't until later. Um, um, I, I, when I was 11, a favorite aunt took me to see Ringling Brothers in New York. Um, and that was a tremendous uh, uh, revelation to me. It was so different from European circus. And just in terms of the magnitude and the impact of three rings and stuff happening the rigging the the you know still workers on 20 foot stilts the the you know 
ponies riding through their legs underneath with plumes. And it was the last year that before um, uh, the sideshow was, was banned. So I got to see the sideshow with the fat lady and the pin, you know, the pin man and the, you know, all Can we, the Karen, I want to just see a show of hands, everybody. If you ever went to the Ringling Brothers Circus, just put your hand up. Oh, it's good that it's a real hand, not a virtual I hand. I did. I did. Okay. Yeah. You can still raise your hand even though you're walking. Okay, cool. My, my, Gene, my, my, my great uncle worked for the uh, Ringling Brothers Circus back in the day, back then. Cool. Hey, yeah. by the way, if we can't see your face, it's as beautiful as those images are. Try and come on camera because it's more, you know, it's nicer to see your face if you if you can. Okay, so there was a time when in between, uh, but you joined the circus. So tell us, like, how did that happen? Like, how did you join? I mean, Scott saw Amici too, but he didn't join the circus. But well, you did. here's where my parallel lives kind of, you know, I have to come into play because, as I said, I was always drawing, always painting. When I was um, 16, I was accepted to Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, which was the only college I applied to, was the only place I really wanted to go. And I was on scholarship. I went there and, um, <clears throat> at, you know, and they took me as a, as a fine artist, but I was determined to keep doing physical studies. I took a little of their dance classes. I wasn't happy. And I discovered they didn't have an independent study program. So I started one at Pratt. And that was so that I could then go on and study along with the art I was learning. I went to study mime with um, to the New York Mime Duet who were the professors at Yale and um, acrobatics with Don Jordan who Italian acrobat in New York and juggling. I learned to juggle with, with um, Peter Kinnean. And um, so I, and then what I did was I took my clown and I started volunteering at the Long Island Jewish Hospital. Um, just on the weekends when I didn't have classes, I would go down and volunteer as a clown there. And what they did was they put me in the burn ward because in Brooklyn, there were so many instances of children being burned and had an entire ward. And they really didn't know what to do with them because they were just virtually mummies. Some of them, only their nostrils or eyes showing. And, you know, so this was traumatic for me. I had never done hospital clowning. Um, and this was really the most incredible, situation to walk into. And I really was flying by the seat of my pants um, in terms of learning. That sounds like a, a clown thing to do, flying yeah, the seat yeah, of your pants. I mean, you say, uh, but... That's very clowny. Uh, I have a question. So uh, you did pins, you juggled pins and balls? Well, yes, you learn when you juggle, once you learn the pattern, you, you try all objects. And then in what's the big the most, I have a question, what, what's, the the big most, what's the most number of balls? Also, no, it's jump. not Superman juggling that interests me or that I okay. that I partake in. All right, that I numbers and questions. numbers, but that doesn't, you know. Okay. I met Sergei Ignatov early on from the Moscow Circus, who was the first man to do eleven, you know, rings. But it's more what you do with the juggling and how you, you know, in the Big Apple Circus, I, my partner and I were kooks. We were clown kooks, and we juggled. Bottles, knives, pots, pans, potatoes, forks, um, uh, you know, it, it's the creativity of what you do with skills, any skills is really what interests me, not the... It's not quantity. Not quantity. Okay, so uh, can we hear like uh, a story? Were you integrating? Let's hear one more circuit story and then let's hear a story. Oh, like, oh my goodness. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, uh, well, let's hear a know, circus story. Uh, uh, well, you know, let's keep talking because another one's going to come up. Okay, fine. All right. So, <laughs> all right. So, I want to get to the the intersection of clown, circus, and art. 
Okay. So when you when you were in the circus, uh, how so did the how did that intersection happen for you? Okay. So I will tell you the most. Um, so here's your story, and here's the answer to that question. So the most magical summers that I had were were when I was touring with a little French circus. Um, throughout Southern France, a company for a little tented show, <coughs> excuse me, and we would go down into these tiny little villages. I'm talking about 500 people. And the mayor was also the school teacher, was also the garbage collector, was also the, you know, the priest. So it, it was really small. And the entire village came to our shows. We would set up the tent and there were only a dozen of us. We would set up the tent and then we would perform. And then after the performance, the mayor would usually invite us to his house and the entire village would go. <laughs> There'd be a lot of people outside as well as in. They were big houses. But I can remember at that point early on, I didn't have quite a command of the French language yet. And so my, the directress of the circus would often translate for me. And at one point we were in the kitchen with all the women, of course. And she said, um, I said, um, Adrienne, um, where's the bathroom? And she said, oh, the bathroom. And she announced to all the women that I had to go to the bathroom. Whereupon everybody promptly put on their jackets. They opened the door and trooped out into the backyard. But everybody came with me, all the women in the circus. And I realized that they were, this was some kind of camaraderie that if one woman was going, everybody had to go. So there we were about 50 women peeing in the grass. Um, and then we went back in. And were you, I have a question, were you in grass? <laughs> in the south of France or just peeing on the grass? No. <laughs> Okay. But, but we, you know, they, they also the gypsies, there are always gypsies in the area and the gypsies would come to our shows. We never charged them. They were, they came for free. They came with their goats. The goats were not allowed in, but the gypsies were. And afterwards, often as a thank you, they would pull out their violins and they would serenade us. And mm. it was just beautiful. And then after everyone had gone to sleep, because you have to remember, these people were used to waking up early and but, but you have to remember, I was the um, insomniac New Yorker who had joined them. So I would take my pastels and walk out into the field to the back of the field, where I only had the moon to illuminate what I was doing. And I would just sit and I would draw the tent. That was what allured me that the, those summers, the tent in the light, the moonlight. And uh, you know, when you talk about plain air painters, <clears throat> you don't <throat> normally think about it with the light of the moon, yeah. but it, uh, it's very, very nice. Plein air by the, the lune. That's fantastic. Okay. Not so terrible. you've been, so you're, you're in the South of France. Did you, I mean, when did, did you come back to America? Oh, yeah. uh, did you can like were you did you do a body of work where tell me where you you were in you were in Europe tell me I, how did you come well, back well I did I did several European tours and then but always came back at that point you know this is after graduating from Pratt and I had a, a loft and I had several lofts in Manhattan and um and I would go back to my loft and my lofts were big and I would I, you know, on the road, you can only take pastels and, and gouache and watercolor and pencils. You know, um, back in New York, I would paint in oils. That was my preferred medium. Do you still have a loft? No, I gave Darn that it. up 10 years ago. Okay, that's, I know those Soho, it was no doubt in Soho, right? It was on the Bowery. Okay, cool. Bowery and Bond. That's great. So did you have a body of work that you created by the moon? Yes, my pastel. Yes, I still have a few left. I've sold many, but I still have, and they can be seen on my website. I have I have quite a few on my website. Um, OK, cool. Well, that's so great. that to me, that to me was. The dream life to be performing by day and to be painting at night. It was just, and in the company of just these beautiful people. Um, that sounds and, fantastic. So yeah. um, 
what you drew, what you painted, what was the so was there the subject matter? Did it relate to the circus? I mean, because this is a art, this is the humor arts museum, right? That Barbara's created. So I'm wondering, I'm trying to tie it back into the the light, the day and the night. Well, you know, you, know it... you know, Gene, I've traveled with so many circuses, three ring in America, one ring in in and then circus theater festivals. And I am never, ever, ever without a sketchbooks and and you know, water-based paints at least. Um, I, and I have thousands of sketchbooks in my house of, of you know, work I've done, uh, um, either drawing the artists back a lot, drawing them, if, if there was a long gap between when I had to go out, I would sketch them from the wings, you know, um, or, or of the tent, which that, that always intrigued me. Did you um, ever, uh, did you like moleskin? You know, those great sketchbooks of moleskin? Back then, I don't think I could afford them. I took whatever I could get. <laughs> okay. okay, 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 cool. All right, so um, so let's, let's bring it up more recently. So you've had a body of work, you've had a, a career in, in the arts. And so you meet Barbara in Beacon, you, kind of like melt into each other. And <laughs> I, mean, I was there, I saw you, I was yeah, looking at the yeah. art and you were melting, you were confabulating. And, um, and so you decided to do this pretty interesting and unique uh, collaboration, the Humor Arts Museum. And I think it was really interesting because Barbara had this idea and she found you and the fact that you guys were clown, cl were clowns, uh, and I mean there were so many uh, converging, mm -hmm. uh, you know, notes that it was meant to be. It was, mm -hmm. <clears throat> like I said, kismet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was somewhere between Bashert and kismet and clown. yes, yes. So okay, so you decided to do this collaboration, this museum online that will one day have a, a home. And well, so what did that look like? You know, how, how did you develop that? Like, how are we gonna do this? And, and then we'll get to the art and then we'll talk about some of the art and, and, and get into that. Well, I, just to, as a note to that, um, relative to that, I, I've been curating for, for a while now and I love curating. I'm, I'm in love with curating and, and we can talk about what that is later. But, um, and I was at that point when I met Barbara, I was on my um, last show as a curator. I'd been curating for a year at this cultural center in Beacon. And this was my last show. Um, so I, let's get into it. Let's get into it. That's a really good, good point. So we talked earlier uh, today in preparation for this about curation and, yeah. you know, can you describe to us what you mean by curation? Because uh, some people may not, some people might have different points of view, but what do you mean by curation? How is it okay. different than just choosing? For, for me, curating is, it's kind of an umbrella role. Um, it's like an orchestra conductor or even a circus ringmaster in that you're overseeing all the players, all the elements, the overall picture, um, mood, sound, and by sound, I mean the aesthetic atmosphere. Um, you're responsible for choosing the people whose art you would like um, uh, um, to exhibit. And then every aspect of uh, collecting the art, um, uh, <clears throat> physically hanging it, installing it, um, collecting the narratives, I always, I like very much to um, have text or narratives with the paintings, whether my own or other artists. And some of the artists here who have worked with me, uh, Ruth and Orna, they know that. And they also um, write beautifully. So, it's, so when you say text your narratives, can you put that in? Yeah, that is something that connects the viewer with the artwork when they're looking at it a little more. Not that it needs it art, but sometimes it's really nice in a, in a community or in a, um, a large exhibition venue to feel, to understand 
the circumstances by which this artist created this piece, the inspiration, the materials, where they were, what affected them, what they were trying to express, just, you know, a more personal note of, from the artist. All right, so um, that would, the texture narrative could also be called a object label. <laughs> right, I mean, it, I mean, but it. I mean, That's it's, a, it's a label. Hard. It's a label that connects you to the to the work of art. It's a narrative. Yeah. It's a narrative. Yeah, a narrative. That yep. you because they're Got not it. facts; they're stories, and my artists really are wonderful in writing them as stories. And that's. that's great. And I will tell you from my experience al alone that you know at first the the administration was like a gas going nobody will read them and. I tell you, they could not believe how people stayed in an exhibit. They were used to people walking in, spending five minutes walking out. Nobody walked in there without spending less than an hour and everybody, people were, like, were waiting to read the next narrative. People read every single one. And yeah, actually, no one's allowed to leave the Zoom until they read all of the text narratives. On that's the good. Zoom. So, that's good. I like that. You know, <laughs> okay, that's I I get it. You know, because in the art world, I I read a lot of artist statements, and there's these panels, and um, they can they can often be um, very very long winded mm -hmm. and not really, uh, I would just say gobbledygook and art speak. And when I read the object the text narratives that you provided. They were really great. Do you want to read? Is there one you want to read to give us a, give a sense, maybe? Um, if, uh, is Petra in there? Is, yeah, Precipice. Uh, no, no, you passed her. Keep going. Uh, you, you, it's down towards the bottom. There. There, there it is. So this, this is a portrait of my good friend Petra Lang, a German acrobat and aerialist who um, used to come to New York with her partner, Luke Wilson, who was a legendary juggler in Europe. And they used to stay with me and perform for me for 16 years. I ran a, um, I ran a circus variety show on a showboat in New York and they would come and I, you know, to them it was- What did you say? You ran a- A, a circus showboat? variety show on a showboat in New York. <clears throat> uh -huh. Okay, all right, we'll, we'll come back to that. Can you just, why don't you just read the object, the text narrative? Well, as I wrote it, I can tell you, but I can read. This is a portrait of Petra, a remarkable aerialist acrobat who dated a long time friend of mine, the legendary British juggler, Luke Wilson. They both came to visit me often in New York City when I had a loft on the Bowery and performed in my showboat series. Two weeks after Luke proposed to Petra, he was diagnosed with cancer and died three months later. Petra, devastated, called from Germany and described how she could not even stand, let alone balance anymore. She felt she was living on a precipice. This oil painting and one of Luke were exhibited at the Crystal Palace Theater Gallery in Leipzig, Germany, almost 10 years ago. So, and this is a good example of how I feel it gives you more, other than reading the title Precipice and seeing that she's in a precarious position, but that this gives you more of a feeling and understanding of why I painted it and, and about her. Completely. I mean, it's a, I mean, with, that draws you in. I, I had goosebumps and like felt sad and felt connected to her. Yeah, well, that ex perfectly explained your point. Isn't yeah. that wonderful? <laughs> That's great. Okay, uh, is there another one you'd wanna, is there another work of art you'd like to showcase? Um, keep going. <laughs> Um, oh, I have a question while we while yeah. we decide on this. So often when you curate, a curator usually curates other people's shows. Yes. But this is a curation that you did. It's a solo show of your work that you curated. Um, it's a form of not nepotism, but uh, 
but you know, it, it's sort of, it's artist, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> that that it's usually, you don't always curate, your, you're usually curating someone else's show. I'm just wondering how it's different to curate your own show uh, than other people's. Is, is that a fair question? Yeah, it's, it's easier. I can look in the mirror and yell at myself. You know, I, I don't have to feel bad that I'll feel bad. I, 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 um, it, <clears throat> it's, it's a lot more, there's a lot more uh, tension and nervousness when I'm working with other people because I want to do them right. I want to do right by them. I want to make their art shine and I want to be fair in, in terms of the, you know, the big picture. Um, <clears throat> and personalities are personalities and sometimes, you know, dealing with a lot of different. What do you mean by big, what do you mean by big picture? Well, when you put together, uh, when you create a show and you put together an, a, an exhibition of multiple artists, um, um, you also had to consider what, if there's a theme, um, you're of course choosing work that resonates within that theme, but you also want to make sure that um, the art as a whole works, that it has a, 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 fee, a feel qualitatively and also in terms of uh, um, um, heartfully that it, it has a connection um, to both um, the theme and, you know, and the work to each other. <clears throat> okay, so here's what we're going to do. Um, if, if anyone has quite, we're going to take questions in a little bit. Uh, if there's any questions from all of the folks on the Zoom. Um, I wanted to ask a question, by the way, all the works are for sale if anyone wants to, to uh, acquire one. Um, it wouldn't be right if I was an art dealer and didn't mention that. Uh, and <laughs> And you can talk to Barbara about that and like that. Um, what, Karen, <clears throat> what is it about this work, uh, your work, or it could be a specific work that we could showcase that we would never know, sort of like what you just did with, with that one a precipice uh, about the work or your work uh, and where you're at now that we'd never know unless I asked you this question, sort of. Ooh, it's a very good question, Jean. Um, Barbara always asks that question. Whenever we go to art shows and the artist yeah. is present, somewhere during the opening, Barbara will sashay up to the artist and she'll say, what would we never know about your art if I didn't ask? Is there something you can you know, glean and, and share with us of insight? And there's always something that's quite remarkable that, that unfolds. So. I'm going to pass Barbara's great question to you, and I'm on the edge of my couch. Um, no pressure. Well, for those of you who, who are here, who are friends with me and who know me and have known me for a long time, um, several of you hit that bill. Um, I, I will tell you that I was a very shy and reclusive child, and now you will all laugh. <clears throat> um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 true and and when I paint now I've always painted in reclusivity I I I, I enjoy being um you know almost in a trance working and I can work like for eight hours and lose myself would that um, be called a clance because I'm sorry, I it was an attempt at humor. Okay, but but the one thing I've I've discovered that in both art and clowning, how important listening is, and and I don't mean he hearing um, voices or audio. I mean what the moment is telling you, being receptive to what is happening around you and what you're feeling, very importantly. A good clown is above all vulnerable. A good artist is above all vulnerable. And you find how to read yourself and how to make what is, um, you know, vital to you and what, uh, um, <clears throat> find its way onto a page 
or into a skin. It's, it comes from the heart. It comes from, um, uh, sometimes it comes from trauma. Sometimes it comes from um, <clears throat> a memory, but it, it's, it's um, um, I, you know, I find now that I'm going back to um, uh, experiences from my youth and, and finding ways to slide that in and, and, and incorporate. <clears throat> That's great. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, open it up for questions and I'm going to um, pass it back to Barbara and Karen, I want thank to thank you. you for thank you, Gene, very much for, for doing this, for being here. And yeah. Being yeah, it was a lot of fun. And I look forward to uh, future curations. I'm glad that I now know not to put uh, the in front of circus certain times. And I'm delighted that we had an opportunity. So uh, let's open it up. And and if, if anyone have a question for me or Barbara or Karen, please open it up. You could put questions in the chat. We have uh, a question in the chat. There's a question in the chat from Nicholas Hall. The question is, yeah. how has humor impacted your artwork, if at all? Oh, I think I would hope that it's evident when you look at some of the artwork that's in my solo show that <clears throat> the humor, whether it's in animals or portraits that, that I really try and bring out the, the um, uh, I want you to look at at something and be smiling or chortle, you know. And I think, I hope that's what some of my work does, that it has a this girl um, um, reaction. Um, it it I I work in a you know I learned early on the importance of yin yang. Um, when I went to Pratt, I was really a a realist surrealist painter, and while there, I focused on abstract work. And I've, and this is again, is, is how I'm finding now, I'm working both now. I'm taking my, my abstract um, background and experience and combining it with figurative. But <clears throat> in every work I do, I want it to have a dramatic impact, uh, an emotional impact. That's my goal. So if you look at these and you're not moved, I, I'm a failure. So smiling and chortling, uh, what else? Uh, giggling, like what, uh, what are some of the other things that we might- Why giggle when you can have a belly laugh? I mean, really go all the way. Okay, it's better for the solar plexus. Yeah. Uh, oh, I, have, I, I had another question about some of your inspiration, oh. inspiration artists, inspirational <laughs> artists that like you, because I <laughs> went yesterday to the Whitney and I saw the Hopper show. Ah. And he's a great painter, yeah. but everybody in his paintings, all the humans, men, women, they're bummed out. They're, they're, they're disconnected. They're forlorn. Like I was really, I, I wanted to like, I wanted Did to you love come home show. and have a bottle of Cabernet. It's, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, you know what? I, I stopped drinking. It almost led me to drink. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. It, um, they were yeah. very disconnected and so great painter, but like a bummer. I was looking at everyone going, really? I was like- But it's a feeling, you know, it's loneliness. It's a very, very yeah. pronounced feeling. And like Karen was saying, the most important thing, certainly in what I do and what she said she did is evoking an emotion, an emotional response to the work. So, I mean, mm -hmm. even if that response is an empathy for, for, for uh, loneliness, that's mm -hmm. a response. And it's a, it's brilliant that he can evoke that from a single frame. Mm -hmm. My favorite teacher at Pratt was named Jake Berthaud, and he was a wonderful painter. And he was a very dark and somber painter to, to his whole life, all his work. And but I learned so much from from his work and from having him as a teacher. But it was so the antithesis of humor and bright work, but. My God, he is someone who inspired me throughout my life. And then there's also, again, the yin yang, the antithesis of Jake's work would be someone I also admire, Bonnard, very famous French 
you know, you know, Pierre. I love Bonar's palette, his, his, his uh, dynamics, his brush strokes, his color, it, it, just so luminous. I, I love it. And I would say in terms of circus artists, Dame, Dame Laura Knight, if anyone doesn't know who she is, look her up. She's an extraordinary she was the artist who, um, she was the courtroom artist for the Nuremberg trials. Mm. And which of course was very, you know, very harrowing for her. And afterwards she immersed herself in circus and went on the road with circuses. And her paintings and drawings are just remarkable. Just, just. Hey, awesome. Karen, what about, I just <clears throat> want to ask about Mark Chagall since he's so circusy and, you know, like, he, uh, any thoughts, any reaction to the work of Mark Chagall? I, I love his work. I love his work. He's, he's, you know, it's, it's, um, he remained true to his style his whole life. He never moved from that feeling, which was a combination of, of um, folk tales and the persecution he experienced in Russia in his native land before he moved to Paris. So um, there is a great deal of, of torture, but there's also a great deal of joy in his paintings, which is, you know, they're, they're ultimately yeah. those are looking uplifting. They're looking to the light. We have in the chat, well, Nisha, Nisha saying, precipice really stood out to me. Nisha, why is that? You're on mute at the moment. <clears throat> oh, um. <clears throat> Why did it stand out to me? Um, <coughs> I, you know, I just saw, um, you know, saw this woman hanging out on a cliff and, and then with the title precipice, you just sort of sit there and go, oh, what, like without reading the description, like what's going on, what's going on there, what's going on and with this woman and this, you know, in this scene. And I also think it, you interact with art based on what's going on in your life, right? Like I, you know, I've got good change happening. And so I may, maybe I'm on the precipice of something, whatever that might be. So it just kind of spoke to me in that way that it just kind of drew me, right? I'm like, whoa, she's hanging out there on this cliff and what's happening. So, yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you. <clears throat> it looks like there's more questions, Barbara, can you? Yes, who else has a question? Okay, Kate has a question. I'm wondering about Karen's family. Were they artistic, humorous, supportive at an early age? I like your work very much. Oh, thank you, Kate. Um, actually, no. <laughs> This is, here's where I get to be the Debbie Downer. <laughs> my, my, <clears throat> my mother was not at all supportive. My father was always at work. He didn't know anything, but my mother was not supportive. And, um, um, uh, but I, I, I will say one, I would say one thing that I think talks about people are always saying, you know, my God, you never sleep. You're always doing so many things. And, and, and this is why I, um, I, I was the middle child of, well, five children, except that I have to correct that to be six because I had a baby sister who died of sudden death in syndrome um, when she was six months old. She was the child before me. And I was born nine months to the day they buried her. And as a child, my mother was constantly taunting me, telling me, you're only the ghost of your dead baby sister. No. <clears throat> so I took that seriously, which meant I, I had a lot of concussions. I was always trying to walk through walls. I was like banging into walls. Um, but, you know, I grew up feeling like I was living for the both of us, that her spirit was embedded in me. And um, which would explain my intense drive and, and multiplicity of interests. Um, you know, who knows, maybe she was meant to be the artist and I was just supposed to be a valley girl. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> that same after, thing happened to Salvador Dali. He had a brother who died and he also was always in his shadow. Mm. 
It's a very interesting story. I met Salvador Dali when I was working at Sam Flax. Do you remember, Susan? <laughs> Dali? You Dali, did, huh? yes. He and Galina came in. And boy, did she hate me because Dali walked in and, and saw me at the register and went like this with his finger. And my boss said, go with him, go with him. You have to go with him. I said, where am I going? And she said, just walk around the store. Anywhere. You, if Salvador yeah. Dali oh, goes yeah, like yeah. this, you this, go that, where? Absolutely. So wow. I, I would follow him around the store for an hour with Galena after me, following me and glaring at me. And he would pick up art supplies and hold them up. And I'd smile and nod. And he, we just, I had to walk around the store for an hour. And he finally selected a marker. He selected a marker and he held it up for me and I nodded and then he turned and he walked out. And did he pay for it? Well, no. And I, I turned to my boss and I said, well, he didn't pay. And she said, it's OK. I said, but does she need sign something? She said, do you know what his signature is worth? No, he never signs. <laughs> well, actually, the story with him is he signed about 10,000 sheets of blank paper. Uh, and <laughs> before they were printed. It's a whole nother story we'll get into another oh. time, but uh, it ended up, the truck overturned in the south of France. Uh, <laughs> in, 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 no, in, in, in Northern Spain near Figuras where he lived and they, they, they went all over the highway and it was known that he signed blank sheets of paper. So um, it, that's a no-no. You typically sign the work <laughs> when it's printed. <laughs> uh, anyway. It's a funny story about Salvador Dali. There, were, there was a lot of famous people who used to come into the store. And I remember all of us just being re really cool about it. And when I yeah. dealt with very well, quite a few of them, I just made believe that I didn't know who they were. And yeah. I helped them with what they were looking for and whatever, and just treated them, you know. But it ha it happened a lot, so I know exactly what Karen's talking about. But I well, wasn't in New York. Know. We typically do that, right? You typically. Yeah, I mean, like... I just wasn't like in intimidated. I actually ran the fine arts department, and you know, and it was just, it was just one of those things that you know, actually, it was kind of fun. It was. It, a lot of times it was funny, especially after they left. <laughs> so we're coming to the top of the hour soon. And so I'm just going to, since you put this up, can I yeah. explain what this is? Yeah, this, we're going to look at some new work that Karen is This is a right piece now. that I, I pride myself on being a quick sketch artist. Having said that, this is a piece that took me three years to create. It's four and a half feet long, two and a half feet high. It's pencil primarily with an acrylic wash and it is a portrait of <clears throat> um, Ringling Brothers signature setup of their their whole setup of their tents from 1938 outside Scranton Pennsylvania it was like a city their 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 setup the main tent alone that big tent seated 10,000 people, oh. just to give you a sense of the perspective. I was working from a very grainy black and white photo and um, I just was so stunned by the magnitude of this, you know, I spent three years working on it. Um, and and it's new, that. it hasn't been on my website yet, so I'm yeah. going to show it. So uh, in the chat, I have posted, uh, I have posted how to support Humor Arts Museum. So Humor Arts Museum and House of Holy Humor, we have a founders campaign right now, which is called 100,000 million, which is a hundred people giving a thousand dollars to create a million laughs of relief. And it's like, wait, that math doesn't work out, but laughter is exponential. So of course, if we have a hundred people give a thousand dollars to create not just a hundred thousand, but a million laughs of relief because laughter goes on and on and on and passes itself along. And I think that with this with this talk today, and thank you so much, Jean, and thank you so much, Karen, uh, it's important to remember that laughter comes from difficulty. Humor, humor comes from difficult things. It comes from the thing that went wrong, the thing that's not working out, the thing we're trying for, the thing we're heartbroken about, the thing we long for. Humor 
humor comes from from the the ups and downs of life and i think we've really marinated in that today so in the chat are how to support the humor arts museum the current exhibition which is up until the 13th and after which karen will be curating a group show that spans history humorous art uh throughout the history karen what's the oldest oldest work in that show um, I, I believe it's the 1700s so 1700s to today uh Following that, we'll have a um, my friend Robert Bostick, who has created a clown, not clown, a cartoon, searchable cartoon library. Is will be also curating a, a show of um, of cartoon art, and then we've got Karen's art website and Jean's art website. So, as I said in the beginning, so this is the very first day. This is the very first public event of Humor Arts Museum, and to know that you are here on the first day will always be meaningful to me. And it is an honor to collaborate with you, Karen, and thank you for supporting and caring for us, Jean. And I really appreciate everyone for being here. So we can, it, it, thank it, you. it's the top of the hour. So if you need to go, please feel free to go. Know that you are very seen, heard, celebrated, loved and adored, which are the things that I do. Uh, and if you'd like to hang out for a few more minutes and chat, we'll be here. Could, could we have some more questions? Because I see there are some that are- Yeah, if anybody wants to hang out, we can certainly hang out for a little tiny bit. <clears throat> Does anybody have any, any other questions in our hang time? We've got a bunch of comments in the chat saying, uh, oh, uh, yes, we have, uh, Karen, how did your artistic process change over the years? And that uh, is Um. Uh, Again, I, I depending on what situation I'm in, where I'm in, I, um, I, I, whenever I'm doing a show, you know, having lived in New York City for 40 years when I wasn't on tour, um, I saw a lot of concert shows, theater, you know, dance, um, and I was always drawing. I always draw. I drew, you know, um, so I have my quick line sketches, and then on the other end of the spectrum are my very long worked oil paintings. So, um, and both borrow from each other. I, I um, but <clears throat> it's the circumstances by which you're painting is, or drawing is, is always um, different and you respond to each. Um, I don't know if that answers your, I, I feel like I've gotten um, obviously better with my quick sketch over the years. And I like my longer process has started to take longer that I really mull over um, my acrylic and oil paintings, that they, they I, and I think it's more of a reflective process. I will do a little work and I will stop and I will look at them quite a while. And that I think is different from um, the pace I took as a young painter. <clears throat> and Nick is requesting one more clown story. Oh. Um, in particular, anything, Nick? Uh, um, um, okay, um, I was performing at one point. Sorry, something to make me laugh. It to was make you for laugh. a good, good belly laugh story. Something. Okay, okay, we'll yeah. we'll go there. We'll go. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free. Um, I was performing with my two partners. <clears throat> we were doing acrobatics and uh we were at a university somewhere down south and um we were on this big theater stage and we did a trick where um my one partner was on my shoulders and i was um kind of in a bent leg position and the other partner was on my thighs balanced and i held on to a belt um uh around his waist he had a belt and <clears throat> we got up into the position and I had been arguing with him about the use of the belt. I said, I hate the belts. Can I just hold your thighs? And he said, no, the belt, the belt. And I said, okay, so we used the belt. I'm holding on to him, we're in the position. And of course the belt snaps, the belt breaks. My partner goes flying one direction overhead 
um, I go flying because my balance is connected to, I go flying straight back and <clears throat> Edgar goes flying off. So we went three different directions flying. Luckily, we're all acrobats. We all rolled and came up, but he stood up. I turned and looked at Nikki. She turned and looked at me and we looked at Edgar and he's in between us and his pants fell down. So this is with about 1500 people <coughs> in the audience. It was the biggest laugh we got and it was not planned. It was, and I was laughing so hard, I couldn't leave the stage. I was bent over laughing. And um, we stumbled off and, <laughs> and that was, <clears throat> it was really hard to go back on because that we knew we wouldn't do better than that. Um, but that, that was life. Declaring yeah. itself a clown. Nick, does that satisfy uh, your, your desire for a clown story? Yeah, that's why I'm always kind of back and forth on the belt myself. So good <laughs> opportunity. <laughs> thanks for thanks for the talk today. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you for tuning in. And are there are there any last questions during our after party? Yes, Don. Thank you, Karen, it was great. Barbara. Hold on, we have we have a question from Don. Okay. Who's on mute, which is funny. <laughs> there we go. Okay. <laughs> this um just in knowing how physical you are and the physicality of your performances and that that training performance experience, how has that physicality affected your empathy, your ability to identify with the people that you sketch? Ah, wow, what a good question. <clears throat> um, wow, it's a really good question. <laughs> I think you've almost stumped me. It's a, there's a, <laughs> there's a, um, there's a fluidity that has to happen when, when you're sketching um, quick sketch. And I learned very early on, in fact, it was one of the things I learned from Pratt. We had a teacher who made us um, draw without looking at the page at all. We had to do entire drawings without looking at the page. And that has, because when I draw at performances, I'm in the dark, it's a darkened theater. You can't see what you're doing. So there's no sense to even look down. You just go by instinct and, <clears throat> And uh, um, and when you're a performer, when you're an acrobat, especially, there is a certain amount of that intuitiveness. That's it's a it's a combination of intuition and listening, listening to your body, listening to your partner, um, listening to what's happening around you. That receptiveness I talked about. Um, the um, and if it, it, you know, and making split second decisions like when we felt that we were all off balance and flying in the air, which wasn't to happen, how you, you know, um, come out of that. Um, and again, it's, it's instinct and it's training from so many years of doing it. Um, but it, it's, um, I just know that that connection when I look at someone who's really impressing me or, or moving me that I can just translate it um, and that's a wonderful feeling too. It's a power I, I, um, um, that I love, that I have. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know if I've answered your question, Don, but I just rattled on. No, perfect. It was wonderful. Thank you for sharing that insight. Yeah. Yeah, because the, um, yeah. the sketches come from someone who's embodied because the sketches are lively and embodied as well. They're very physical. Yeah, they have to be. It's, you know, that's, yeah, that's what I'm drawing from, that drawing and the ex double meaning. <clears throat> like your, your pen or pencil is a, a stylus and we're recording the heartbeat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Becomes so, thank you. And as a way to say thanks, see you later, see you next time.
We'll take a little stroll through the exhibition. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Barbara. And Barbara, thank wonderful. you so much for this. This has been wonderful, and I really appreciate your <clears throat> curating this whole it's opportunity. It's an honor and a pleasure to collaborate with you. And thank you, Jean, for being in conversation. Please check out both Bravo, uh, Jean. Karen and Jean's art websites in the chat. Support Humor Arts Museum at that link. It's also possible to be members, and there's subscriptions. And in addition to the 100,000 million campaign, and the uh, this exhibition will be up until the 15th of November, and then we'll look forward to humorous art throughout history, at least from 1700, which is pretty darn recent, but still. So uh, I am Reverend Barbara Ann Michaels, Jester of the Peace. It is my honor and pleasure to be with you, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so you much. This road. is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. See you down the road. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thanks for reminding me. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. Oh. Bye bye. Thank you. See you all. Thank you so bye. much. Bye. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye. We can stay in chat mm -hmm. if you want. We're going to go and we'll see you. See you soon. Uh, yeah, we'll see you soon. Thank you, Barbara. Bye, Karen. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Yes.